Welcome back to my layer. Today's build is a new one for me because this time around I'm building custom end tables for a friend. And I've never built something large for someone else before, only for myself. So naturally that means that I'll have to overthink everything twice as hard because if I make a mistake, I can't expect other people to ignore it as easily as I would. This is going to be a really good, really frustrating exercise for me, both physically and mentally. So, let's go build some things. So, this friend recently bought a house, and she asked me if I could make two end tables for her. The reason they need to be custom is because when she put the couch in this nook in the living room, she had these really oddly sized gaps on each side. They are really long and narrow and not only that, but the trim along the wall is a bit wider than normal, so not only does the end table itself need to be very specific, but the legs also have to be set a lot further in than normal, otherwise it won't be able to clear the trim. The trick here is that I'm a bad friend and I haven't had a chance to visit her place yet. In, in my defense, she lives kind of far. But that means that I only had the pictures to go off of and her measurements. And it's not that I don't trust her measuring, it's that if you use two different tools to measure something, you will get two different results. Now throwing two different people using two different tools and you'll have a whole mess on your hands. To make it even worse, this also means that I couldn't go re-measure things as stuff came up during the build, so I really felt like I had to have a lot of trust in my own decisions, which is obviously not how I operate. To make sure I wasn't missing anything, I talked through my design with my friend, who is also my shopmate, just to get his take on things, and he actually found something that could have been a complete oversight in the measurement communication area that I didn't consider. So I went back to my friend and I asked for clarification. I just wanted to add that bit in here because when working on these projects, when you're pretty much going in blind without being able to look at the space yourself, you want to make sure that your plans don't have any holes in them. Okay, here's the design. She gave me completely free reign to do whatever I wanted, as long as I stuck to the dimensions she gave me. The height needs to be 25 inches, the length 40, the width 7.5, and, and the legs can't be any wider than 5 inches from end to end. Because of how narrow the legs had to be, I decided that it's best to just use one wide leg instead of two, because with those dimensions, I would have to put the two legs so close together that they would look like one anyways. I did decide to make the width 7.25 inches instead of 7.5, just to be safe. Trying to fit something exact next to a wall is a really good way to find out that your walls aren't exactly straight, which is way more common than you think. And since I won't be able to make any adjustments if I find out that the tables don't fit, I wanted to make sure that I had a little wiggle room to make sure they can really get in there. I want to point out that in my plans I made sure to account for the thickness of my table saw blade, which is one eighth of an inch. This means that if I put two parts right next to each other, I have to add one eighth to that measurement, otherwise I'll be losing that length for one of the pieces. Accounting for this is super important in cases like this, where you have to place two things right next to each other and want to make sure that you have enough material. Okay, back to the actual build. When I was cutting the parts, I tried to be strategic and have as many solid scrap pieces as I could, because I planned on using them later. This is something that I'll keep stressing throughout my videos, to not only consider the best cut for parts that you need, but also for what's going to leave you the most useful scraps for later. This is what we have so far. Now I have to make a way to join all of these parts. I'm going to use one of the bread and butter joints for woodworkers, which is called mortise and tenon. Or more specifically for this case, a through mortise and tenon. The first step for this is, I have to measure out how deep I want the tenon to go into the mortise. I want mine to go all the way through, 
which means that I'll need it to be the length of the thickness of the wood. To make sure everything is identical, I set up my guide on one side, and I set this based on how wide I wanted the tenon to be. So, the part that goes inside. And then, I set up another guide to serve as a stopping point. And I measured this to be the thickness of the wood, starting from the beginning of the blade to the stopping point. If this doesn't make sense, I promise it will in a second, you just have to see it. I then clamped down the guide and ran top and bottom of the legs through it, flipping on each side. Almost there. I then readjusted my guide so that I can cut off the side pieces. I didn't need a stopping point this time because I knew to flip the piece around as soon as I got to the notch that I just made. Then I ran all the leg parts through it one more time. This part that I had left is called a tenon. It is the first half of what I need for my joint. When I was done, I double checked that everything was identical, and now we're ready for the second half of the joint, which is called the mortise. To make sure I didn't screw this up, I created a template. I did this by cutting out a hole in masonite, using the dimensions of the tenon, and then gluing extra bumpers to it. That way the router bit really doesn't have anywhere to go. I then glue these guides on the side, that way I can move the template around and know that I'll always be in the center of the piece. I also made sure to test out different approaches for the mortise, and I had a lot of fails before I found the right one. I tried different methods for cutting out the corners and making the hole into a rectangle, but no matter how I did it, I couldn't get a super clean edge. Now, this normally doesn't matter too much for this type of joint because the tenon usually doesn't go all the way through, so the whole thing is pretty hidden. But in my case, since I'm having it come out on the other side, those lines really have to look super crisp, otherwise it'll look janky. Because of this, I decided that it's best to keep the mortise rounded, and then I'll adjust the tenon so that it fits into the slot. I tested this out on scrap wood 11 times to make sure that everything was consistent and looked exactly how I wanted it to look. I then used my plunge router and a pattern router bit with a top bearing to create the mortise slots. I was doing the first cut, after testing this out a bunch of times on scrap pieces of wood, remember that. And then my mold broke, and I went way outside of the line I was supposed to stay inside of. Just tore right through it. It worked so consistently on scrap. Why? <laughs> but you know what? I learned something recently. As my woodworking improves, I somehow don't seem to make much fewer mistakes. They're always different mistakes, because I obviously learned to avoid what I messed up previously, but new things always happen. The way that I can tell that I'm getting better isn't because I no longer make mistakes, but because I'm getting a lot better at fixing them as they happen. It's like my friend always tells me, it's only a screw up if you can't fix it. Even three months ago, had this happened to me, I would consider this to be a unsolvable problem and would need to go back to the hardware store to get more wood and start making this part from scratch. But this time around, I took a walk around the shop, complained to my friends, and then went back and fixed my template and kept on going as planned. Because I knew that as annoying as this mistake was, it's actually pretty fixable. And I had a plan for how to do it. We'll circle back to that later. Aside from the template screw up, everything else went well. I know this end cut looks weird, but that's because the end leg joints and the middle leg joints need to be slightly different. I'll cut off these thin parts on a bandsaw and it'll look much better. Again, 
it'll make sense when you see it, so just stick with me. Trust the process. I finished up the first bottom slab and made sure that the tenon sample I had fit in well, so that it was in the exact center and that when it came through, it was flush with the top. Which it was, so, so far so good. Only one screw up so far. When I cut the bottom parts, I took care of the ends on the bandsaw. This is how they looked. The reason I made them like this is because I want the outside of the edge legs to be flush with the bottom piece. So for the outside legs, the outside edge of the mortise is going to be square and the inside curved. And then for the middle legs, the entire mortise is going to be curved. This is an aesthetic choice, not a structural one. I just think that it's going to give it a way nicer look. I also want to reiterate that for the mortise and tenon joints, you don't have to go all the way through. If anything, they typically don't come out on the other side. I did consider for a bit not going all the way through because that would make my life so much easier, but there are a few reasons I decided against it. For one, the plywood is only three quarters of an inch thick. That means that if I went only halfway through, there wouldn't be a lot of surface area to make it a really strong joint. You need to get it in there if you really want it to hold. But if I went in more than halfway in, because the glue has to go somewhere when I'm putting the joint together, and this is plywood, I risk either pushing through the top and making a hole, or pushing the top layer up, having it unglue, and then making it bubble at the top. These two are the main reasons I wanted to go all the way through. The other minor reason was because I was so restricted by the measurements that I couldn't really do anything cool with the design, I thought that having a variation on the surface would give it a bit of a pizzazz, if you will, and make it have more of a personality. That way, it's not just a slab of wood on top, but it has a bit more dimension when you look at it from the top. Okay, next, I had to make sure that the tenon could fit into the mortise. So I traced the shape of the mortise curve, and then I grabbed a trusty old Dremel with a sanding bit, and I rounded off all the tenons. I was careful with this because I tend to get carried away when I'm in the zone and I only needed to round off the tenons of the middle legs and the inside facing side of the outside legs. God, I just said that out loud and heard how nonsensical it sounds, so if you're still with me and listening, thank you. But I marked the sides that need to be adjusted so that I wouldn't get carried away and mess up. And when I was done? I made sure that it all fit. Then finally, I had to router the mortise of the larger pieces that will go on the top of the tables. For this, I didn't actually use a template because I wanted to make sure that everything lines up exactly. I clamped the bottom pieces that already had the holes drilled and I used that as a template. As long as I made sure to plunge the router up to the bearing before I started moving it around, everything would work out fine. If I started moving it before the bearing was low enough, I would damage the piece that I was using as a template and I'd have even more of a mess to clean up. Again, this is not something that should be stressful, but I just decided to overthink it. Welcome to my channel. This is how we do things here. Also, I had to maneuver the router around the clamps because they were so close and I didn't want to bump into them. It made things so awkward, but it was manageable, so I didn't bother stopping and adjusting my approach. And then finally, I used the large top part that I just cut as a template for the last piece. Before gluing, I sanded down all the pieces first. I alternated between doing it by hand and using a sander, and the way that I usually decide that it's smooth enough is when I can run my hand along the edge and not get a splinter which is not recommended. I don't know why that's my go-to. I also used the sander to round off the edges just a little bit. I didn't want to use a router because that would be too much and I didn't think that the fully rounded edge would work for this style and the space where it needed to go. Also, I just want to say this here, in case you noticed a sudden change in video quality halfway through, it's because I decided to play around with some settings to see if I can improve the quality of my videos, and I recorded the second half of my footage in HDR. 
which was a horrible idea. The files were huge and an absolute pain to work with, but the video also looks way too saturated. So I tried to fix it in editing, but I'm not sure if it made a difference. All in all, 0 out of 10, won't be doing this again. I'll just stick to 4K from now on, lesson learned, I'm sorry. Okay, now we're coming back to this mess up. Let's fix it. I grabbed one of the scraps that was similar to the color of the piece, and I sketched out the shape of the divot. I then used a bandsaw and a dremel to slowly shape it into the shape of the gap. I made sure that it fit, and then I glued and clamped it. And then I let the whole thing set. When it was done, I sanded it down a bit, and this is how it looks. If you look at the layers of the cross section, you can tell that it's an additional piece, more than you can if you look at it from the top. But that's where the tenon is going to go, so you won't be able to see it at all. One lesson that I learned while doing this is that I should have made sure that the grain of the filler piece was going in the same direction as the rest of the grain. That would have made it blend in even more. I feel like that's probably something that's really obvious that I should have considered, but it didn't click until I was standing here looking at the finished piece. So that's a lesson learned for next time. But honestly, I'm not mad at it. I think it blends in pretty well, especially because of where it is. It's right behind the leg, so I doubt that it will be noticeable at all. If this happens again, and if it's in a super visible area, I feel fairly confident that I'll be able to patch it up so that it's mostly unnoticeable. So, this is weird, but I'm actually kind of glad that this happened, because it was a really good thing to learn. But, shh, don't tell my friend I said that. If she asks, this never happened. Everything passed my quality control test. And now we can glue it all together. I had to do these one by one because I needed the large clamps and I don't have enough of those for both tables. But that's okay. It gives me time to take a breath between gluings. As soon as I was done clamping, I made sure that my angles were exactly 90 degrees and then I let everything set. Next, it was time for the stain. My friend's house has this really amazing wood aesthetic. The doors, the windowsills, trim. It's not painted white like you usually see in houses, but they're rather just dark stained wood, which I love so much. And I wanted the tables to match that as close as possible. Because cameras are unreliable when it comes to color, I made these three stain samples and sent them to her. I tried to pick a good range, so I chose a dark one, a lighter one, and then this one that is a bit more red than I thought it would be, but I figured it's worth checking out anyways. This way she can actually see what the stain will look like on the wood, and then decide which one she likes the best. She liked the dark one, so that's what I went with. I applied the stain, and then after it dried, I took some steel wool and very lightly sanded everything down. This step really makes a difference in how smooth everything is in the end. Even though wood was sanded down before I applied the stain, since wood reacts to liquid, it reacts to the stain by expanding and raising. So even though it was as smooth as I could possibly make it beforehand, some of the work was undone once I applied this finish. So I have to go back and re-sand it without damaging any of the color. I also added felt to the bottom of the tables off camera, which brought them back to the height that I needed, which is 25 inches. When that was done, I topped it off with two layers of satin poly, and this is the final result. I won't lie, we had a bit of a rough patch there in the middle, but we really pulled through. Good work, team. I keep going back and forth on if I should post this video now or after she has the chance to come over, grab the tables, and then send me a picture of how they look in the space, assuming that they even fit. But that'll be another month or so before she comes here with a car, and if I wait that long, I'll fall even further behind on my videos. So, I'll show you what they look like now, and then I'll post an update after she gets them home. Luckily, we have a similarly sized space here at the shop, next to this absolutely disgusting couch that I sometimes pass out on when I'm here very late and the table actually fits in really well. So hopefully she likes it and it works for her space.
I'll make sure to keep you updated. But, as always, feel free to let me know what you think down in the comments. Both praises and critiques are accepted. I can handle it. And before I wrap up, I just wanted to thank everyone who liked and disliked my previous video. I ended up getting 103 interaction things. I said I was going to add up the thumbs up and thumbs down and then add 100 to that number and then donate that to the World Wildlife Fund. So that means that I will be donating $203. I really appreciate everybody's support. I'll do more of these as my channel hopefully gets bigger and I'll be able to donate even more to charities as time goes on. Here is as much proof of my donation as I can give without giving away any of my credit card information. I think I'm just paranoid because I've been hearing too much lately about YouTubers and TikTokers lying about sponsorships and donating money that they promised they were going to donate. So now I want to make sure that I don't come off as a liar. So I want to make sure that I provide receipts. So hopefully this is good enough. Um, maybe in the future, if there's a better way for me to prove it, then I'll do that. Just let me know what you prefer. But in any case, thank you all so much for all of the support, both in just that one previous video and all the support so far. And I'll see you in my next one. Hopefully not in a month though. I need to get better with uploading. But yeah, have a good one. Bye.